Hello, and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, episode 26, Digestif. Coming to you from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We're here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. Each week, we hope to highlight some of that feedback, both positive or negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. And if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. So, wow, I got a ton of comments, mostly on social media, on my Less Shame, More Game post and our podcast episode. The biggest thing was when I shared pictures of my current piles of shame. Like, everyone came out of the woodwork to comment on the games. I had a bunch of people that really didn't get the concept and wanted to buy them off me. And then I had someone else that was trying to convince me to donate them to the local library. And I'm like, no, 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 I plan to play these games. They're shameful. I'm not looking to get rid of them. I want to play these games. But as for actual comments, we're just going to highlight a few of those. So even if I don't read your comment out loud or we don't read your comment out loud on the show, please know that I think the feedback is awesome and I welcome the interaction. So the first one is Michael Junker wrote, our shelf of shame isn't too bad, but there are a few things that have been here for six plus months. And we had a bunch of new stuff come in over the holidays. They're high on my list for tackling early in 2019. It always seems to happen over the holidays. Now, Sean Cloutier uh, said, that's my goal every year. And we play a sizable portion of unplayed games annually. Mm -hmm. The problem is I acquire many new titles throughout the year, and those often supplant planned plays of prior purchases, such that we end the year with almost as many unplayed as we started with. If there weren't so many great titles being produced, it'd be much easier to get through the backlog. I'm not complaining, though. We really are enjoying this era of board game resurgence. Uh, you and me both, Sean. That is the problem. Actually, if you've been paying attention to the pile of shame, there's an awful lot of games that hit it last week and are already off the pile. And there's games that have been there three years. So Martin Ralia, uh, the founder of Gnome Stew, writes, The magic number challenge on Board Game Geek keeps me focused enough to get mine to zero last year from a much lower starting point. And I also play less often than I think you do. Might be worth a shot. So what I'm going to do is, Sean will probably drop the link in chat, is this is a challenge on Board Game Geek that they have every year. We're not going to read this off because it's it's huge. Um, Martin did the 2018 challenge, but I did find a link to the 2019 challenge. Now I'm going to pause for a moment on this. So my less shame, more game number includes every game, every expansion that I own that I haven't played. That also includes games that I have played other people's copies, but haven't played my own. Now, the magic number challenge has a few more restrictions. So the magic number should not include games that you own, but have played elsewhere. If you've played another copy somewhere, cross it off the list. Expansions. The magic number is about base games, not expansions. Uh, three, games that you own for purposes other than playing. Games that you intend to sell, trade, give away, or are just keeping for some reason, but never intend to play. Even if it's just that you don't want to ever play it. Uh, referred to as deferred games. Now, the other one is games that you own that aren't physically in your possession. So if you've ordered it, pre-ordered it, kickstarted it, been bor borrowed by someone else indefinitely, take those off the list. Those don't count either. And then finally, games that you have played in digital format. Now, this is an optional rule because a lot of people are on both sides of the fence on that one. Okay, so taking my list in those rules, it significantly reduces my pile. I would be down to only 50 games. While that does seem more manageable, I really want to track those expansions especially. Like, I chose to spend my gaming budget on those, and them not being played to me is just as shameful as a full game not being played. Plus, I also like to keep games... Uh, on the list that I played other people's copies because I did buy it after the fact for myself. And the fact that I spent my money and haven't played my copy, I find just as shameful. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tabletops? 
Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On the Table. So this week, I've got dinosaurs, tree spirits, and a ton of stained glass, and a bit more. I've got Hogwarts, Race for the Galaxy, Takedo, and even some checkers. Wow, checkers. That's a classic. So last week, I talked about how I tried Dinosaur Island. I don't know if you listened to the last show, but if you did, I pointed out we had to play like a lightning quick game. It was a two-player game where we didn't have a lot of time before the local game store closed. So we used like the easiest set of rules with the beginner um, scoring cards and all that and managed to finish a game in like half an hour. I, at the time, I didn't want to talk about what I thought of the game because I didn't think it was a fair assessment of what the game's like. And I noted that I was looking forward to a full game. Well, I got in that full game on Monday. Uh, it was a full three-player game uh, with Deanna, Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, but Sean Hamilton. And we played using the short game gold cards. So the game comes with a bunch of these goals, sets of goals. They're short, medium, and long game goals. They determine the game lengths, and you're going to use a number of cards equal to the number of players plus one, and when all but one of those goals is completed, the game ends, like immediately, like you've completed three goals, game's done. So this was only our second game, and using the short game cards. I'm sure there's no less space required with Ooh. three players than with two. No, and setup is still quite a pain. There are a lot of little things to get put into place, lots of little cubes to slot on your board. It is not a quick setup. Uh, I do not own a box insert. I'm getting tempted. Uh, just even the sheer number of little purple, purple pink dinosaur, I guess they're pink, dinosaur, meeple, whatever you want to call it, dino meeple, uh, that you have to sort through. There's a ton of stuff. And yes, the table, it's a table hog with two. With three, you are adding two more boards with room to put cards around them to the table. Uh, I did share pictures on the blog. I think I shared some on Twitter. It takes up a lot of room. Now, the game itself was much better with three. Uh, it's basically, the game itself is uh, Jurassic Park, the board game. They obviously couldn't get the license for it, but that's what you're doing. Each player has their own park. They have three scientists and a collection of park workers. You start off with a research phase where you use those scientists uh, via worker placement to harvest DNA, research new dinosaur types, or improve your DNA cold storage. Now, the neat bit is your scientists have levels. So you have a level one, two, and three, and you get more. Like if you use a third level scientist to harvest DNA, you get three times as much DNA. And you also require certain levels of scientists to get different dinos, like to, to learn the DNA pattern for a herbivore, you only need a level one scientist. Once you've all done the scientist phase taking turns, you have a market phase. Now you're using your in-game money to do things like improve your lab, build attractions for your theme park. So this is like food stands, roller coasters, that kind of stuff. Hire specialists or buy DNA that you weren't able to get in the last phase. Now that's followed by yet another work and placement phase, but this time you're using those park workers. And this time you're doing things like birthing dinosaurs, improving your containment facilities, increasing your security, combining DNA. Now, what I really like about this phase is it doesn't affect any other players. So once you know this phase, you can all do it simultaneously. This is also the phase where you have the most workers. You start with five and you can hire more. So the phase where you're making the most decisions, everyone can do at the same time. So now is this the key to the, the speed of this game that we've been talking about? Is it that symmetrical play? That is definitely does add to it. I, right now, because we're playing the short game, I think the goals are having more of a factor on when the game ends. But this definitely affects how quick a round is, how, how quick it takes to get around the table on everyone's turn. Overall game length, I think, though, is going to be more affected by those um, scoring cards. So now that you've done the first phase, you've done worker placement, you've done shopping, you've done worker placement again, you have what's called the park phase. So this one's kind of unique. You take this really nice bag full of meeple and you pull out a number of these little meeple based on how exciting your park is, which was determined by how many dinosaurs and attractions you have. Um, what you're hoping for is patrons. Now, patrons line up outside your park and they pay you a buck each to get into your park. And it doesn't even matter if there's room for them in your park. You're making that money no matter what. It also doesn't matter if something else happens to them, which we'll get to in a minute. What you don't want are hooligans. So some of the people in the bag are different colored. And these are nasty people who sneak into your park and they don't pay to get in. So once everyone's pulled their meeple, you then manage the lines. And what you do is you take the meeple in order and you put them onto your attractions. Now, again, the hooligans are bastards who push ahead and have to get 
have to get placed per first. Wow. Have to get placed first and a cut in line. So you have to place them. Then you place your other workers or sorry, the other people, the patrons. And if you don't have enough room in your park, there's people who end up still stuck outside in line. What's amusing is you still charge them. So, I mean, I know life's not fair, but those hooligans sound really overpowered. Oh, that they're huge, but it's it's a big part of the game, right? Like that that's part of the fun is seeing if uh, when, last time in this game and she games Deanna pulled way too many hooligans and got pretty screwed over by them. So now you've got your hooligans in your park, you got your patrons in your park. Now's the fun part. Now you have to see if any of your dinosaurs get out. If your security isn't high enough, dinos go on a rampage and eat, and we assume in the way for herbivores trample patrons. Now, of course, the hooligans are far too sneaky to get eaten. Then you count up how many patrons are still left in your park, and you get victory points for those. Now, there's obviously much more to the game than this. Uh, that's just kind of an overview. I didn't get into the details of how to do upgrades or anything else. I got to say straight up, overall, I love the theme. The theme is fantastic. I'm not as huge a fan of the neon 80s look. Uh, somehow this on the board, I, on the table, seems a little bit garish. Uh, but it works, I guess. At least it's all tied together. I did talk a bit last week about component quality. It's excellent, even if some of the extreme upgrades I have, the Kickstarter Extreme Edition, are a bit superfluous. The game is fun, but still, the short game is short. The game ends too quick. It doesn't even feel like it's an engine building game, right? And it doesn't even feel like your engine's going and it ends. It's not the good kind of engine builder ending. Like, for example, Russian Railroads, it ends too soon. You're like, oh, one more turn. But when every player is thinking, oh, one more turn, and I would have done it, it's, it's perfect. It's cut off right at the right point where your engine got to run once, but that's it. This doesn't get that far. Like, it, it's like I just put gas in the engine. Maybe I've started the car, but I haven't gone anywhere. It's I find that very disappointing. It's interesting about the theme. Uh, you you mentioned that you uh, you weren't sure about the uh, the neon eighties. Yeah, but, uh, you know, at the same time, you know, with Laser Riders, uh, we love that neon eighties theme. So, uh, is it just too much on on Dino? Because I, I noticed that the the box cover really does kind of throw it in your face, and they don't have the black to balance it. I, I, I don't know. It's too much or it's just not as tied in like 80s and Tron goes hand in hand because Tron came out in the 80s. Uh, Jurassic Park to me doesn't say 80s. And like I said, it's very in your face. I got to admit, I love the slap bracelet. That's a nice touch. But something about the pink dinos and bright green boards, it just it's garish. It, it hurts my eyes or something. Again, once I was playing, I ignored it. But just looking at the game, I got to admit, I wasn't so turned on by the look of it. If it wasn't for many positive reviews, I probably would have avoided this game based on the look. So, so far I'm on the fence about this game. Uh, we played with the short goals. So I guess it's my fault that it was a really short game. Here I thought adding the full short goals instead of this starting game short goals, I thought it was going to be longer and it wasn't. Like I think our first like 20 minute game was only three, was three turns. This three player game, I think only went four. So I'm really hoping that's fixed with a longer game. Uh, Cause as it is, it was unrewarding. And in a way it's almost doesn't feel like it was worth the setup and take down time. So right now the game isn't wowing me. It's not wowing anyone else who's played it. The theme's awesome and it's good. It's just not great. So what I really want to know is if it's better with medium or long time, long term goals. Maybe uh, <clears throat> next time we're I'm down, we can uh, you know set it up on on one of the the other tables, not the main table, but you know have it set up on on the the table in front of the TV where it doesn't matter quite as much and can do some medium or longer time game time. Yeah, if it'll fit on that table, that's a smaller wow. table. <laughs> that's true. There is that problem. It will. It's not quite that big, but yeah. Uh so. That was Dinosaur Oil, and that's kind of my overview of it. So-so. Uh, I, I, I don't quite have buyer's remorse, but it's it's close. I do have the expansion, too. Maybe the expansion will add a bit to it. I'm not willing to try that yet till I play a longer game of the original. So up next is Kodama. Now, this is a game I first played at Origins 2015. Uh, Deanna and I did a demo of it, and we liked it. I, I think I liked it more than her. I thought it was a really cool-looking game, but it just seemed expensive at the time. Now, I honestly don't remember what the cost was, but I remember sitting at Origins, walking up the end of the demo, going, how much is this? Them giving me a number and going, 
Uh, that's a lot for a game that's pretty much all cards. Like the only thing that's not cards in the game is the scoring track and the counters you put on the scoring track. So we passed on it. Now, years later, to uh, forward to 2019, my friend Ross is purging part of his game collection and he had a copy for sale for 10 bucks. At 10 bucks, I was totally all in, had to go for it. So uh, that put it onto the pile of shame. Uh, and the, yes. offici the official name of the game is actually Kodama the Tree Spirits. Yeah, um, true. I, I probably should have said the full name. Now, Kodama is a beautiful game. Like, it just, it's one of those games, like Azul, that you throw down on a table and people look at it like, oh, what's that? That looks so cool. Because what you're doing is building a tree. And it's a very anime-looking tree. Uh, you get a trunk, which has a, like, larger card. And it has a feature on it. And I think there's, like, six different features. So there's, like, mushrooms. There's a worm. There's a star. There's a cloud. There's flowers, and I'm missing one, or maybe there's only five. I don't remember. So you have your trunk, and it has one feature on it. Then you put out a drafting row of branches, and when we played, it was four. So I think it's in the number of players plus one. It may maybe always four. Now each branch has three features on it, and at most two of the same. So you could have two mushrooms and a worm, or you might have two clouds and a star, or you might have a mushroom, a cloud, and a star on it. You pick one of these, and then you have to add it to your tree. And it's got some little restrictive placement where a card can't touch more than one other card and so on. But it doesn't really matter. You're, you're adding, you're building your tree with branches. And then you get points. And the way the points work is by having chains of features going back from your new branch to your trunk. And if it's broken at all, you don't get the point like the chain can be broken so you could have like two stars heading back and then if you don't have a star on the next card but you have it on your trunk you don't keep calling but if you had it all the way you would get four points you end up playing the game through three seasons uh summer spring and, uh, uh, spring summer and fall because in winter the tree doesn't grow that's your final scoring round at the end of each season you have a bonus scoring and this is where the name kodama comes in kodama are these cute i don't know mushroomy looking miyazaki style anime tree spirits and what they do is give you extra points and these give you things like get five points for every mushroom that's within two cards of your tree or get three points for every feature on an ending branch and stuff like that there's all kinds of different cards there's one other complication to the game, which are the spirits of the season. At the start of every season, you draw a spirit card, and it changes the rules. So in spring, all of spring, all cards touching mushrooms or flowers get a bonus point. Or all clouds count as stars for this entire season. So it's interesting. Uh, this is actually a re-implementation of another game by the same designer, Daniel Solis. Mm -hmm. Um and that original game has a much more painterly, um, I guess, very much like Takedo sort of uh, feel to it, a very zen oh. sort of look. And and uh, a lot of players now say that Kodama has surpassed that original game in the actual gameplay. But uh, he, it's it's the games are very similar, except he's gone in very different directions with the art style on the two of them. That's interesting. I wonder how the rules are different so that it, the, the Kodama is better. I got to admit, I guess I'm glad I have the better version. I didn't realize it was based on something else. Yeah. So one of the great things about Kodama is it's very simple to teach. But make sure you cover that scoring a couple times. Uh, people have a hard time with the the skipping it. Like the, the whole, if your chain doesn't go all the way, they want to go all the way to the trunk. The other thing is I've seen people that want to go down one branch to the trunk up another branch. So it's one of those things like go over, make sure everyone's got it. Because in our play, I think it was two seasons in when we realized one of the players was scoring wrong and we didn't catch it until then. So it's fairly simple, but just cover that again. Um, the end result is amazing. i so bummed that I didn't think to take a picture of the everyone's final tree i managed to snag one player's tree but oh they just look cool right you have these neat trees um when we played sean not this sean sean from hamilton not no sean hamilton not sean from hamilton had this one branch that went almost all the way across the table and kept making streams of mushrooms mine was branched out all over because all my kodama cards were for end branches so they looked very different i dig it i dig this game a lot um the biggest thing that Monday told me was, man, why did I wait three years to buy this game? I should have picked it up, uh, especially at 10 bucks. Like I, that was a no brainer. But like at this point, as far as I can tell now, MSRP is 20. So I don't know if it dropped since it was first released at Origins, but I think it's a must buy at 20 bucks. 
Well, now you also, uh, when you saw it at Origins, that was technically pre-release, I believe, because BGG has it listed as 2016 release date. Oh, maybe. So it may be a pre-release price you were uh, you were getting quoted. That is possible. I, I got to say, cons are not a place to buy cheap games. Don't go to cons thinking you're going to get a deal. Like, yeah, there might be auctions or there might be other things, but in general, you're going to pay at least MSRP and in some cases more. Yeah. So the other thing is last year they released a expansion Kodama Duo, uh, which as well as adding a two player version, adds the ability to bring it up to six players maximum as well. So it's a kind of a, it's a two in one sort of, they, they call it Duo, but you actually get an extra player for the full game as well. I wonder what the rules are different for two player because it seems like it would play good two player now. I don't know. We haven't tried it. Well, I, when Enchi Games and I played in 2015, I think there was someone teaching us. That's cool. That is cool. I, I might have to check that out. Like, it's good as it is. I don't know if it needs one. Eh, if I see it for a good price. Oh, Ross has to buy it and then sell it to me. <laughs> <laughs> so after Kodama, Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton. I'm going to get tired of that joke myself. Maybe I'll stop making it. Uh, specifically asked to play Sagrada. And who am I to say no? When someone comes to my house and says, hey, I want to play that, we're going to play that. Now, I've been talking this talking about Sagrada a lot it's so far it's like the Azul of 2019 right like I, I talk about it every week so I'm not going to go over it again uh we did play three player and no I have not tried any of those funky variant rules we've talked about from Board Game Geek um I gotta say this time it didn't feel like there were any color distribution issues it wasn't like we were hurting for yellow um what was fun this game though is the scoring cards are different every game we didn't have a single card that mattered what you put in a row or a column which really opened up where you could play stuff. Like you didn't have to worry about duplicating numbers of colors in a row or column. That was very freeing. It felt very neat. And because of this, it was also the first time I ever filled my entire window. So that was nice. It, it's been a real stained glass kind of month, it turns out. So we'll uh, yes. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Yes, it has. So then moving on to Friday, uh, that's our Gloomhaven stream. Uh, anyone who's watched it knows we beat Scenario 10. So yay. Of note this time was how different that game went from the last one. Now, our second video will be up on YouTube Thursday. I think we're going to have it up and you can compare the two. But man, like it was a very different game. Like this time we spent most of the game in the first room bottlenecked and just waiting for the baddies to come to us, which seemed to work really well. Except we wasted so much time in that room that our two characters that have less cards than everyone else end up exhausted before we got to the final room. Because that's one of the main resources in the game is your cards. And if you spend them too quick, you're going to be out of the game. But thankfully, Tori and I were both in great shape for that last room and were able to finish it up. So next week, uh, we are going to return to Gloomhaven next week or this week, Friday. We're going to return to Gloomhaven, do some stuff there. Then we are coming back to the Elemental Plane, and we are heading to the Elemental Throne Room, and we're going to give this god some kind of what for. Now, if you're not already setting your calendars, that's Friday nights at 8.30 p.m. Join the Bellhop, Angie Games, and Kator in playing Gloomhaven, <laughs> and sometimes even more. And that's at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Oh, yeah, I, I do have to correct myself. I'm sorry, Deanna did make it to the last room. I think she just made it in and then passed out, but she did make it to the last room. My bad. So after we finish Gloomhaven, Tori and Kat are in love with Azul, especially Tori. Tori, Tori now thinks he's a master at it because he's beat his mom and beat us. Uh, they're, they're huge on this game. So I figure this is a great chance. I broke out that copy of Azul stained glass of Sintra that Joe Swick sent me for my birthday. Thanks again, Joe. Now... If you stop by youtube.com slash tabletop bellhop, eventually, not quite yet, but you will be able to see the unboxing and live plays of Azul there. That's uh, we're, we're playing out the uh, releases a little bit. Uh, as of tomorrow at noon, you'll be able to see the Gloomhaven play. And uh, I believe Saturday, our first, uh, first of the Azul videos will probably go up. Yeah, Saturday should be the play and then Monday should be the unboxing. Yeah, it would be correct. I think that'll be right. So yeah, I, at some point we got to do a new schedule so we let everyone know exactly when this stuff's coming out. Sorry, Twitch, for sending people to YouTube, but you know what? We touch all the different ways. So Stained Glass of Sintra, it is in part completely identical to Azul and at other part times very, very different. For one, it's not easy to teach. There is quite a bit more going on in stained glass. Um, I was at a birthday party earlier tonight with a bunch of non-gamers and I brought both games and there was no way 
stained glass was going to hit the table. Azul, I probably could have done. We didn't. We played more party games than that. But yeah, it's it's not a quick teach. Now, the beginning of the game, the drafting is identical. You're you're putting out the the factory coasters. You're putting four tiles on them, and the way you take tiles off is identical. Now, Sintra does have a nice bonus that the tiles are two sided. Or sorry, I'm saying tiles, but like the coasters, the the factories are two sided, with the second side designed to help visually impaired gamers. So big thumbs up uh, to Plan. Is it Plan B Games? I may be getting the wrong company here. Big thumbs up to whoever makes this. Oh, it's not Plan B Games. I got that wrong. My bad. But big th- big thumbs up to the producers of Stained Glass of Sintra for taking that into consideration. Now, placing tiles is completely different, except next, for the fact... Next, next mo- gen. Next move. Next move. Thank you. Wow, I don't know why I was thinking Plan B. Yes, next move games. So placing the tiles is completely different, except for the fact you're putting a tile on a board or a set of tiles. So each player has a player board. And then attached to it are these eight randomized window tiles, window boards, window lines. I don't know what to call them. I, I, I hate saying tiles because I think the tiles, halls, lodges is. But eight randomized window tiles. Each of these is two-sided, and each has a spot for five panes of glass. So these are the tiles. What you're drafting are panes of glass. If I keep saying it that way, we won't get confused. Now, each tile in Sintra, each thing you're drafting, each of the little cubes is a pane of glass. Now, the other thing you have is, uh, I want to call it a meeple, but it's not meeple shaped. You have this glazier token, this token to represent your worker. And it starts at the top of the leftmost window tile. When placing your newly drafted tiles, they either have to go in the row the glazier's on or to the right of that. So this window or those ones over there. And all the tiles have to go on the same pane and any of them that don't break. Unlike Azul, broken tiles are tracked on a central player board as opposed to your own, and you only lose points for them at the end of the game. Now, when you pick a pane to the right of the glazier, the glazier moves. So it gets harder and harder because you're learning out a room to put things on. And instead of drafting a tile, your other action can be move your glazier back to the start of your board. Now, when you fill in all five spots on a window, you do scoring. So each of the six rounds of the game is assigned one pane of glass at the start of the game, random colors, and you get points for every pane of glass in your completed window that matches the round color. Then you get points based on which window you completed. Now, this is on the bottom of the player board, and I couldn't tell you the points off the top of my head, but each row is worth a different amount between three and five points, I think it was. And then to make it even more complicated, you then get more points for every other completed window to the right of the window you just finished. You got all that? Like, it's just a few things scoring. It's not just, hey, it's Scrabble scoring. Um, Then there's more. Once you complete a window, you're going to pick one of your window panes, so one of your little halls, and put it on your player board. If it's your first halls, you're going to take that window tile and you're going to flip it to the other side. If it's your second, though, you remove the window from the board, and now you have less columns to work with for the rest of the game. Now, I, I wouldn't say the game is hard to no. know, but to new players, and especially those who haven't played Azul before, it's oh, tough it's... to picture all of this, especially without having it right there in front of you. Mm-hmm. Uh, even watching the stream last week, I was struggling struggling at times keeping track of, of what all was happening because I didn't have th- those boards right in front of me to be able to, be able to think about it all. Um, yeah. So it's definitely it's definitely something that you don't want to try and you know pick up the rules and and just sort of pick up by by reading through. You need to have that stuff in front of you. Yeah, no, I agree. And the game is terrible for not having any of this somewhere. Like there should be a summary card or a summary sheet that tells you how to score because that's not there anywhere. Again, as the original as well had a nice little thing in the bottom right corner. It was all graphics, but that wasn't anywhere on this, which is odd because it's the same company, right? Same designer. So I I was a little disappointed with that. So the scoring I talked about so far was in-game scoring. And just like Azul, the original, there is end-game scoring. Now, again, we get a little confusing because there's two ways to play. You can use A scoring or B scoring, and everyone uses the same. A scoring gives you points for completed pairs of adjacent windows. Basically, there's a little more to it than that. And then B scoring gives you points for collecting panes of the same color on your player board. And then you multiply that by how many completed windows you have. So for one thing, they're adding multiplication to the game, which is already taking it a step above. 
so that's kind of it. Like I'm, I'm sure everyone listening can see this is or see and hear. There's a lot more going on in stained glass than base as well. Uh, if you want a better, probably more easy to read description, you can head over to the blog where I talk about it and I basically explain this and maybe reading it a second time you can get it. Plus there's a picture of the game so you can try to figure it out. Um, at this point though, overall, I've only played once. It didn't grab me like Azul. I liked it. I had fun. I enjoyed it. But I didn't have that, oh my god, this game is amazing. I must teach other gamers to play it. I didn't have that, oh, next game night, I'm totally bringing this and I'm going to show everyone that happened with Azul. Sintra was more like, hey, I got to show this to those few people I know who already love Azul. And yeah, I want to play it more, but it, it just didn't have that, oh my god, moment that Azul did. So, Sean, how is the defense of Hogwarts going? Well, it took some effort, but we finally managed to defeat Book 5. Uh, I, nice. tweeted, I tweeted out when we did, and USAopoly actually uh, sent me a McGonagall applauding gif in response. Oh, nice. Um, so that was fun. Uh, now, as we were setting up Book 6, we discovered that, as you guessed it, we were playing the extreme version. Uh, now, to be fair, I, I still think we would have taken a few a few runs at it anyway. Um but uh, when I thought I was stacking the deck, I was actually building it properly and I wasn't. <laughs> uh, so by by trying to cheat, I'd actually been playing the proper rules. Um, wow. So we learned that uh, and, and that's going to make a little difference going on. Uh, we took one shot at book six, um, but uh, it was uh, we, we weren't uh, focusing quite as well and we got uh, trounced quite uh, seriously. So this rule you got wrong, is this something you can explain without spoiling? It is, So that actually. other people don't get it wrong? Uh, and actually, it's actually a lot uh, similar to, um, in Cryptozoic games, your first uh, your first opponent is always face up. You've always got the same opponent mm -hmm. there face up. In this case, it's the, the last opponent is always the same. And But that only happens in five. That's not something uh, that, we've that, been yeah, screwing up only, since number no, one or two? No, it only, okay. starts in, it only starts in book five. The end opponent from that point on will always be the same. Okay. Um, and, uh, and we were, we were shuffling him in and yeah, I think we can guess who it is probably, causing, but <laughs> exactly. We were shuffling it in and causing ourselves, uh, a lot more difficulty than we should. Um, so there's that. Uh, Fair. and then, and then, uh, you know, we played a bunch of board game arena stuff. And then finally my daughter who really doesn't enjoy games like chess and, and the Duke, the Duke is not something she has any interest in whatsoever. She challenged me to one of her favorite games, which is just checkers. Now, perhaps much to her dismay, I don't go easy on my kids in games. I don't play down. I don't play dumb. I refuse to. Never have. Um, they aren't going to learn by me coddling them. Now, I'll, yep. offer, I'll offer them suggestions or help. Uh, I, so I, I will play on their side as well. But I'm not going to dumb down my play. Um, and, and I trounced her, but that's fine. <laughs> and she's, because I usually do. Uh, and she still enjoys coming back. And that's what makes it important to me is uh, she enjoyed the challenge and she thinks that and hopes and maybe I, I hope too that someday she'll beat me and uh, I welcome it. Yeah, I'm the same way. I don't tend to uh, take it easy on the kids when playing games for similar reasons. Now, we don't usually play anything as in your face as checkers or chess. That's, right. that's very <laughs> me versus you. Yeah. But yeah, that, it's the other reason I also tend to stick with co-op games with my kids. So for those of you following the Less Shame, More Game Challenge, that is now two games off my pile of shame in the last week. That would be Kodama, The Tree Spirits, and Azul, Stained Glass of Sintra. And that's right. Our shame pile count is down to 78. Woohoo! We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop by and take part in our chat room in the lobby. Thanks to our moderator, Angie Games. Now we're having a quiet night tonight. In, yeah. the, in the room, we've got Commander Root, Jester the Juggler, Positivity Bot, Skinny Seahorse, and Slow Cool. And unfortunately, as far as my math goes, that means we have one person in the, uh, and, uh, and we know they're uh, around, but not actually uh, taking part. So uh, we, we appreciate their, uh, them being around, but, uh, but that's what it is. Yeah, I don't know what it is. The weather outside is frightful in most of... Uh... It is Canada right now and parts of the U.S., so that could be part of it. Yeah, it is definitely miserable out there. Uh, it's it's the kind of iciness that actually brings down power lines. So uh, yeah. I hope everyone's staying warm and safe out there. We can only grow 
through the support of fans like you. So please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or even share to your friends. Wherever you find us, help us grow our audience. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, unboxings, actual plays. We are getting to the point where we are putting out a lot of content, and hopefully in the next two weeks, it's going to get out to something new every day of the week. The newsletter is a great way to keep up with all that content. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. So we've got something new to share with you. If you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you've likely already seen our first Tabletop Bellhop Express Check-In episode. Now, Express Check-In is something new we're trying. It's a new short form format for our content. I like to think of it as the continental breakfast of our live show. It's for those of you who need to eat and run and don't have time to digest a full episode. We've been told that under 20 minutes is sort of that YouTube sweet spot and thought that this would be a content that would appeal to a, appeal to a different audience than our long form podcast episodes. Though if you watch both and listen to us on multiple platforms, you're awesome and I love you. <laughs> Every weekend, I'll be recording a new episode of Express Check-In, where I'll be summarizing most of the content from our live recording. It's just me, not Sean, and while I'll be trying to cover all the main topics, I'll still only be scratching the surface of the full content. And then after some editing and the addition of some graphics, that recording will go live on Sunday mornings on our YouTube channel. If you've subscribed and clicked the bell, you'll hear about it right when it goes live. Now, this content is going to be YouTube exclusive. We won't be recording this live, and we won't be releasing a podcast version. Though I got to admit, we could do a podcast version. So if this is something you're interested in, let us know. I think that'd be a pretty simple port over. If you have checked out our new show, please let us know what you think. Send us a message on social media or email mo at tabletopbellhop.com. So March 15th to 17th, Sean, Deanna, and I will be at Breakout Con in the Sheridan Centre, downtown Toronto, Ontario. This is a fantastic gaming convention that features all forms of gaming, RPGs, LARPs, miniatures, and a fantastic board game room with a huge game library. Now, I'm sure we'll be talking about the show more as it gets closer to this date, but we wanted to start getting the word out there just in case people are interested in meeting up with us there or checking out the con. So at this point, we have a full 25 episodes under our belt, plus a little bit of bonus content. Uh, we're starting to spread to other forms of media and other formats. At this point, we seem to pretty much have figured out what we're doing. Well, for the most part. So we thought this is probably the time, the time had come to open ourselves up to hosting ads, both on the shows and on the blog. We're looking to do 30 second mid-show segment for the live show video podcast. And we are also looking for sidebar ads for the website. So if you dig the show and are interested in having us promote your thing, fire off an email to me at mo at tabletopbellhop.com. Every episode, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media, of course, works as well. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. While I prefer if questions come through the website, uh, they're easier to track. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Today on Ask the Bellhop, we've got a question from Emmett O'Brien, who asks... What are some underrated, lesser known, four to six player board games that can be played after dinner? Well, thanks for the question, Emmett. Uh, this isn't the first question we've gotten from Emmett, and I just want to say keep them coming. I thought this question was a, a really good follow-up to last week, because last week uh, was all about combining food and gaming. That was episode 25, Blue Plate Special, which you should be able to find in our podcast backlog or on YouTube. So... Following up food with games, right? So after dinner games. What does it mean by after dinner games? I probably should have wrote Emmett and asked before deciding to talk about his topic. But to me, it means that it's later in the evening. You're looking for some kind of activity to kill time after the meal and before bed. So I'm going to figure that's probably like two to four hours, right? Something in that range. And I'm going to assume you're looking for either two to three shorter games to play in that time period or one nice long meaty game to fill that time slot. 
So I'm going to cheat, though, right? Like, I'm going to cheat badly here. I'm going to throw part of Emmett's question right out the window. He's looking for lesser-known games, hidden gems, right? Well, my first two games I'm going to mention are neither. I've mentioned both on the show many times, but when I'm looking at four to six players, two to four hour time slot, there's games I am going to grab immediately. The first should be no surprise to anyone who watches the show, and that's Terraforming Mars. Like I do, I love this game. This is one of the best games I own. It's fantastic at all player counts. Now, I got to admit, when you're have full five players you're looking at a slightly longer game and i actually do think the game's better with four but still plays great with five now emmett said four to six players so what do you do if you have six well you could host rule terraforming mars but i don't recommend doing that this is when i put terraforming mars away and i think i would break out power grid now, this is another classic and one of my favorite games of all time uh, it's meaty and rewarding without being overwhelming yes there is some math and power grid the, but it's addition and subtraction. It's it's money math, right? Uh, I've been recommending this game for more than 10 years, and I don't expect that to change. It's interesting because when I thought about dinner games, one of the concepts that came to my mind was sort of a quick and easy setup. And, and I'm not sure Terraforming Mars hits that mark, but that's just me and not one of the requirements that Emmett mentioned. I, I figure, I don't know, after dinner to me means you got time. Like you're not just trying to fire off one game for an hour. But I, I don't know. To me, like that's like a dessert game. You have one game, then everyone goes home. After dinner to me is, all right, we're done eating. It's going to sit down. We're going to play something. Maybe I'm reading it wrong. Emmett, let us know. If, if Sean's right, we'll do a totally different list of quick setup, easy to play games. Though I do have some of those on my current list. Absolutely. So sticking to the rules, right? Uh, I'm done cheating. Terraforming Mars is amazing. I've said it many times. Uh, let's get to the actual question he asked. So he wants four to six players. The thing is, I can go to my basement and look for games that are four to six players, and I am going to find a million. Well, I don't have a million games. I'm going to find an awful lot of games that are four or five players. Amazing, awesome games. Like there are so many. Probably 80% of my games I own play four to five players. So to cut things down to give us less to think about to not have almost every game ever published on this list i decided to stick with games that specifically play well with six players so that's hitting emmett's maximum player count now that said all these games can also be played with four or five but they're really good with six as usual we broke the list down into sections we've got party games the lighter side games with a bit more meat and heavier fare the Bellhop has three game success suggestions in each category, 12 games overall. And we'll start off with party time. So when you hit six players, to me, you're at that sweet spot for most party games, right? You've got team-based games, two teams of three, works perfect. Now, I'm not a huge fan of party games overall, but there are some I really dig and really like. Number one is Concept. This is a clue guessing game. One player gets a card with a clue, which is a word, title, name, or phrase, generally pop culture related, movie titles, superheroes, and so on. And then they have a board in front of them, a huge board. I've never counted them, but there's probably about 70 to 90 icons on them. And like little square icons, like think of icons. And they represent abstract things like man, woman, trees, movies, and so on. And you're trying to get the players to guess what your clue is is by using tokens, by putting them out on this board. The neat part in this game is you don't have to speak. You just use the tokens, and it doesn't actually require any drawing, spelling, or grammar skills that a lot of these clue-based puzzle games need, or trivia knowledge for that matter. That's what I really like about this. So we're going to have to stop putting concepts on the underrated, lesser-known list simply because we keep seeming to be talking about it so often. <laughs> I did check with Emmett. He had never heard a concept. So that, that was one after the fact. Once he read the blog post, he's like, no, no, I hadn't heard a concept. Yeah, and there's like, – this is the usual okay, caveat. We probably should have had the start of this list. These are games I'm guessing are hard are hard to find or, or – not hard to find, but lesser-known or hidden gems. Um, I – consume a lot of board game media i listen to podcasts i read board game geek i i'm active on social media i'm on a ton of groups on facebook that i'll talk about board games so what i hear people talking about all the time is probably very different from the average gamer what they hear or even more so the average person on the street who plays games now and then so this is my opinion on what's 
hard to find, but maybe I'm going to mention that game that you are so sick of hearing about every week. I do apologize. That's probably Terraforming Mars, which is why I cheated at the beginning. So up next, this one's got to be obscure. I don't think people know this one. It's a very silly game that I may require a few adult beverages before you can convince your friends to play. That game is Ugtect. This is a team-based game where one player per team is a caveman architect trying to get the other cavemen to build their vision. Uh, the game includes a play mat instead of different colored blocks for each team. You flip over a card and it shows like a building, a, a thing built out of these blocks, and only the art of text, the architects, can see it, and they have to get their team to build it. The thing is, they aren't allowed to use English. Instead, you have a list of caveman terms like agunga and wonga wonga and body movements that are how you tell the players how to move. So wiggling your hips means flip it over, for example. It is silly, it is over the top, it is crazy, and just to make it even more insane, the game comes with two blow-up clubs that you use to bop your team members with. One bop means yes, you got it right, two bops means no, no, no. Now, if you can't hit your friends over the head with an inflatable club after dinner, well, I would question that friendship. And to go back to Sean's really point, there is no setup in this game, except for maybe inflating the clubs. So my last party game is a game from Z-Man Games called La Boca. L-A-B-O-C-A. -A. I would have never heard of this game myself. Like, this is so hidden gem that I didn't even hear any podcasts talking about it. But way back at one of our early Extra Life events, Z-Man sent us a box of games to play during the event, and this was one of them. Now, this is another block-building game, uh, in a way similar to Ugtech. And instead of teams, though, you're working in pairs, you and one other player. You put the board between you, and you each sit on opposite sides of it. Then a card is drawn and put kind of face up so that each of you can only see one side of the card. And it tells you the pattern you need to see, and your opponent sees the pattern they need to see. Then you have to work together with those blocks so that you each see your own patterns. Uh, it's... Very quick, you're going to get points based on how quick you can get it done. And the neat part is that it isn't actually a team game. It's set up round robin, so you're going to team up with every other player twice. So technically, it's you each on each side of the board, not that which side of the board you're on really matters. So with six players, you're going to play with everyone else twice. If you only play three players, well, sorry, you want a four to six player. If you're playing four players, you're going to play each of the other three players twice. It is hard to overstate how much fun this game is. There are not many games I own where you're playing against another player, and when you finish something, you stop, woot, and high-five each other. It just doesn't happen often at my game tables. This game, it happens. This game is fantastic. It was a huge hit at Extra Life, and it's been a huge hit at every event I've ever brought it out to. I did bring it to Extra Life this year, but I couldn't get it to the table. The other thing that's cool is the way turns rotate, you don't even need an even number of players, so you can play with five, unlike most team games where it has to be the same number of players on each side. Yeah, and this game just looks fantastic. And uh, to me, it really hits a sweet spot here because a lot of times in an after dinner game, you're looking to have a little bit of a social aspect too. You don't mm -hmm. want to be, you know, head down uh, staring yeah. at whatever you're doing. And this game, while the two players who are at the table are really focused, everyone else can still have a little bit of social time mm -hmm. and watch the game waiting for their turn. So it's a really nice mix of a fun game and a social time all at once. Yeah, to be to be honest, that's actually the uh, the good part about party games, right? Now, onto the lighter side, these ones are the ones that really hit the sweet spot uh, for us personally and in the social circles. These are the games that are great for non gamers or when you really want to socialize, talk and chat while also playing game, where the game is part of the socialization and not the main focus. Yeah, just like Sean was just saying, these are the kind of things where, yeah, you're playing, but you're also chit-chatting, you're also talking, you're having drinks, and you don't need to be laser-focused on the game. So I'm going to bring up a classic here. Here's one of the ones where I'm not sure if it really belongs on a hidden gem or not. We call the game Bean. If people come to my house like, hey, you want to play some Bean? They know what I'm talking about. This is the game that made Uwe Rosenberg famous. Uh, this is long before his big Euro games, Agricola and Caverna. Uh, that game is Bonanza. It's spelled weird. It's not like Bonanza, the old TV show. It's B-O-H-N-A-N-Z-A, -A -A because I guess B-A-O-H-N-Bon is bean in German. 
you wonder why we call them Euro games. So back in the late 1990s, this game was hot. Like every event you went to, people were playing it. Uh, there weren't really podcasters in 1990, but the bloggers were talking about this game. If you went on board game forums, this was recommended as a great game for larger groups. This game was hot. But the thing is, I haven't heard much about Bean probably in the last five years. I've never heard anyone even talk about Bonanza. So that's why I'm thinking it's... Can, uh, to me, it's a hidden gem because it's an older game. It's still on the market. It's Rio Grande games. You can still buy it. It's not hard to find, but no one see, there's no buzz about it. I still love it. Like I've been playing since I think it's 1997. It actually came out. We got it pretty close to when it came out and I, I play it. It's, it's a trading based card game where you're planting bean fields with one rule. I still to this day have not seen in another card game, which is when you get your hand of cards, you can't change the order of the cards. And you are forced to play that front card at the front of your row on the start of your turn no matter what. So if it's something you don't want, you need to work your butt off trying to trade that card away before it gets to your turn. And it's a pure trading game. I'm going to give you two of these. No, I'm going to give you three and going back and forth trying to get the right beans out. If you have not tried Bonanza, I strongly recommend checking out this game. Yeah, no, it's incredibly easy to teach. And with that hand mechanic... You don't always need to be focused on your hand, right. shuffling things around and, and working on that. So you've just got that much more time to socialize mm -hmm. unless you're desperate to get rid of that one bean you can't uh, oh, yeah. hold on to. Again, yeah, I haven't played this since you guys were uh, at the, the Legion or wherever it was yep. way back when. Uh, but no, it's a, it's a fantastic game. And uh, three to seven with uh, three to seven players, uh, unless you've got the original version, the original German version only actually plays three to five. Well, good thing for the improved uh, improvement on the German original. But Sean's right, right? Like the, one of the other things that's really quick in this game is like, oh, wax beans for sale. I don't need one. Tune right out, right? Until it comes back to your turn. Yeah, I don't need those. Yeah, I don't. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Did he say this? Right? You jump right back in. I dig it. So up next is another game with a local nickname, and that is Rise of Augustus, or as we affectionately like to call it, Roman Bingo. In this game, you're trying to build a tableau of Roman senators and provinces, right? Your whole Mediterranean Romans taking over the world thing. You're going to do this by collecting the resources on the cards. Once you've got all the resources on the senator, he goes into your tableau and then he, he, he's done. Then same thing for the provinces. Once you've got the things the province needs to be taken over, it goes your thing. Now, the thing is, these resources are generated completely randomly by someone pulling them out of a bag, just like bingo. I guess they're not in a big rolling, tumbling thing, but it's bag bingo. Now, of course, there's more going on than bingo here, but that's the basic mechanic of the game is pull out random thing. Does anyone need any any Roman legions? Yeah, you need a Roman legion. Yeah, you need, oh, I needed two Roman legion. And then deciding where they go. As you After you complete a card, this is the, the big decision point in the game is there's a big drafting row and you have to decide what card to get next. So it's like, oh, do I take one with lots of icons? It's going to take me a long time to fill, but it's really powerful. Or I take one with only two Roman legions on it that I'm going to get the score right away. Like, it is so simple in its basis, but there is way more going on than you'd first think looking at it. Like every time I teach the game, I'm like, we're going to do this. Everyone's like, so it's bingo? And I'm like, yeah, it's bingo, but try it. And then they finish and they're like, oh, wow, that's actually really good. Yeah, you were right. Oh, man, there was, oh, and I got that one senator that screwed the other player over. Man, this is a good game. Uh, so let's be honest. Even if it was a Roman-themed bingo, there are far worse social games to play than you're sitting back relaxing after a nice meal. But yeah. I will specifically limit that to at home. Uh, I actually worked as a professional bingo caller for a while and unpleasant is the nice term I would use to describe the environment inside a professional bingo hall. At least now they're all non-smoking. I was a smoker at the time, so I could survive. But oh, even yeah. then I, I was, I, I never did the caller, but I did the sell cards for charities thing. And as a smoker, I did not want to go into the smoking room. It was terrible. My, my favorite part of, uh, of that was they, they, at the time they were moving towards the no smoking. Uh, so there was a non-smoking section. Huh. So <laughs> in, in a giant hall filled with like fog levels of cigarette smoke, there was like one table where there were non-smokers sitting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> bingo halls used to be blue. It was yeah. disturbing. So my last light game, so again, games that don't require a lot of focus but are still really good, is a game called San Francisco Cable Car. Uh, 
or I guess just cable card, depending on which edition you pick up. Now, this is a big box queen game. And yes, the box is ridiculous. It's huge. Every time I mention this game, someone complains about the box. I swear this episode is going to go live. And by next Wednesday, there will be someone comments about cable cards. Great. But yes, it has more wasted space in the box than nearly any other game in my connection collection. But let's ignore that because the game is really good. This, to me, is an evolution of Suro. Uh, I'm hoping most people have heard of Suro. That's a, it's a mass market game you can get pretty much everywhere that's actually really good. Uh, this is a tile-laying, path-making game that uses, I don't know what they're called, but there's a certain thing where if you have four points onto a card and you drew every single pattern possible so that each exits out every different exit, that's all the tiles in the game. That's what Suro has as well. Is, uh, there's a certain name for that type of tile. Uh, the difference in this, though, is you're building rail paths and you're trying to make the longest rail path for your cable cars, getting bonus points if you get them to the station in the middle of the board. Now, the biggest difference is in Suro, you have one dragon and you're building your one path for your one dragon. In cable car, though, you have multiple cars, like a lot. If, if I remember correctly, you get more cars, the least players. And I think in one game, you could have up to eight cable cars that are yours. And you're trying to score all of them. So you're trying to focus on a lot of cards at once. And the other thing, though, is you can play your tiles anywhere. They don't have to connect to your cards. So a lot of the game is about screwing your opponent's routes rather than building your own. Or, well, building your own, really. Now, the other thing that's cool about Cable Car is there is a set of variant rules that add stops kind of like an 18xx game that kick the game up to the next weight class. Like once you throw the stocks in the game, it's less of a light game. You're, you're, you're almost looking at the next category. Now with these rules, no one plays any color. So no one owns any of the cable cards, but you can buy stocks in the various colors. So what you're trying to do is manipulate the market and try to get the ones you have the most stocks in to score. But then if you notice one's getting a lot more longer routes, you might want to swap up your portfolio. It's really cool. It's, it's, it's really steps the game up to another level. And I love the fact that you get basically a light game and a heavy game in the same box, even if that box is mostly air. Now, as I understand it, cable car is actually just a pretty much direct retheme of Metro. The only a real addition was the stock holding uh, aspect that they added in when they when they packaged it as cable car. Uh, Actually, no, because Metro has the stocks too. Really? I was looking at it at CG Realm today. Interesting. I wonder. So, if that's, I wonder if that's a, a different edition of uh, um, a different edition of Metro from. See, so Metro they had at CG Realm was a new release, so they oh, must okay. have re put it out. The thing I noticed, because um, I read the show notes ahead of time, was that San Francisco cable cars come with nice wooden cable cars, whereas Metro had little cardboard chits. Yeah. It also comes with five expansions, one of which being the stock market. So I have a feeling they took Metro, improved it, and released cable car. And then, and then I don't know if it was people Metro. complaining about the box for cable car or what, but then went and put what was in cable car back into Metro. Right. I'm not. I'm not sure, but I, I was actually looking at it today. Much smaller box, much more in the box, so I think it might be worth it. But I do really dig either version. Like if Metro is as close to Cable Car as it looks like it is, I buy either. Personally, I, I, Cable Car takes up a ton of room on your shelf for not a lot of components, but the wooden bits are nice. Yeah, and if they've added all the all the additional pieces into Metro, then uh, there we go. So now on, we've got a bit more meat. When the focus is more on the game and everyone has to pay a bit more attention to what's happening at the table, these games are a bit longer as well. So I'm going to mention a company, and I bet you everyone who, um, when I mention this, anyone who, any gamer is going to immediately think of a few games. So that company is Stone Mayor Games. And I'm going to think pretty much everyone out there is like Scythe. Scythe is so good. Oh, my God, Scythe is great. I, you know what? I think even Scythe plays six players. Maybe it belongs on this list, but I'm not a huge fan of Scythe. Maybe some other people out there are going to be like, oh, Charterstone, that really cool campaign style game. I, I've heard it's good. I don't own it. What I don't think anyone is going to think is a game called Euphoria, Build a Better Dystopia. This is a lesser known Stonemaier game that has such a unique theme. It drew me to it immediately. It is um, Orwellian. It's every player represents an oppressive faction in a dystopian world. And it's a worker placement game. And your workers are basically slaves that are represented by dice. Here's the kicker. Each round you roll your dice. 
and you total up the pips to determine how knowledgeable your workforce is. There's a problem with this. If your workers learn too much, they get too smart and they realize you're abusing them and they'll desert you. So you need to try to keep your workplace workforce under control. And then you're going to use these assets to build buildings, mine resources, complete projects, and so on. It's it's a bigger, heavier games. This is one of the few worker placement games, or in this case, dice placement games, in my collection that plays well with six. But those dice, my go- they're hideous. Yeah. They are, I, I, I looked at but those and- They're the plebs, they're the, the workers. You're not oh. supposed to think they're attractive. You don't even want to touch them. It, oh. it just fits the theme. I guess, they were just horrible. <laughs> Now, the other yeah. thing I want to mention is don't confuse this with Leaders of Euphoria, Choose a Better Oppressor, because uh, that's actually a social deduction game, which may be your sort of thing, but it is definitely different than Euphoria Build a Better Dystopia. For obvious reasons, I haven't picked that up. Anyone <laughs> who watches the show regularly knows why I haven't even touched that game. All right. I'm kind of hoping Sean can help me here with this. Um, you know those puzzle games where you got like a maze on a grid? And you got a playing piece and you can flick it basically. You can move it one direction. Like they're often on apps where you just flick the direction and the thing goes in a straight line until it hits a wall or another piece. Is there a name for those? Like, is there? I no? I was digging around and I'm yeah. sure there is, but I think you got to be. You know, I'm sure uh, Charles probably knows. I, uh... <laughs> there you go. Like, there's a ton of this kind of puzzle, right? Like, I remember there, the one was an app where you're, I was sliding penguins on ice, and they were trying to get to the fish. And I know, like, Final Fantasy used to use these puzzles where you'd, like, go in a dungeon, and there'd be a rock boulder, and you'd have to push the boulders the right way to get through the maze. Like, I know there's a word for this kind of puzzle. I, I If anyone knows in the chat or after the fact, send me a message. Cause it's been driving me nuts. So I couldn't find it. All right, what what that has to do with any of this? Mutant Meeple is a board game version of that style of sliding puzzle. Now, it's a re-implementation of a game called Ricochet Robots. Ricochet Robots, you had your maze, you put out a target, and then you tried to find a way to get the robots to the target in the least number of moves. Really simple. They're just basic. They go in straight lines, stop when they hit a wall, or stop when they hit another robot. Now, Mutant Meeple is the exact same game, except the designer gave each Meeple a superpower that breaks the rules. So, like, one of them has jumping, and it ignores the first wall. Another one has uh, teleportation, and what that means is in the game they can wrap around the board. There's another one that can move diagonals instead of orthogonally, and so on. And I think there's eight different types of Meeples, each with its own superpower. So you start off the round by putting a target on the board. You just roll dice, like a a grid. Like, what do you call that? where you roll in the X and Y axis twice to get a number. I'm terrible on names of things today. I, oh. plane? Yeah, basically. That wasn't the word I was looking for. <laughs> but yeah, you, you're doing the whole grid placement thing. You know, the, the G5 hit, that type of thing. You're, you're, you're putting a target out. Then all the players look at all the meeple on the board and try to figure out who can get a meeple to that target in the least number of moves. And everyone does this real time. So you're sitting there thinking about it and you're putting a little marker on your board so you can do it. The first person who solved it and thinks they've got the answer says solved or something. I forget exactly what they say. And then you flip over a timer and then everyone else has whatever's in the timer, whether it's a minute, 30 seconds. I don't remember what it is to get get their move in or they're out. Then the player who bid the lowest, who said, I can do it in six moves. I can do it in five. Well, the person in five then has to prove, show their proof. They have to go, okay, I'm going to use this meeple to do this, this, then this meeple is going to do this, and then this guy gets to the target. And then if they do it, they score. Now, when they score, the meeple they scored with, they turn face down, and they can't use that meeple for the rest of the game. So it gets harder because you have less meeple to, to use. It's a very neat game, but man, is there a caveat. Charles loves it. My friend Tom loves it. Anchi Games absolutely hated it. I had a friend who walked out partway through the game. I think it was Ross. I don't remember. You have to like puzzles. This is a pure puzzle. If you like those straight line puzzle games and are good at it, you're going to enjoy this game. If you don't like puzzles, you're probably going to sit there thinking, oh my God, I'm stupid. Everyone else is smarter than me. This is not fun. And you don't want that. You don't want to make one of the other players feel stupid. So this one, huge caveat. I dig it. I like it a lot. I would love to play this with the full eight players, but I can't find eight friends that actually like this style of game. Yeah, 
I'm really on the fence of these sort of games. I can enjoy them, but the mood has to be just right and, and only once in a while. Uh, so yes, again, you really have to know your audience before you bring out a game like this because uh, things could go bad quickly. Yeah, like I, said, I basically had someone not flip the table, but walk out mid-game. So that did happen. And thank ours aides in the chat for coordinates. That was the word I was looking for. You roll up the coordinates on the board and you put a target. Uh, where was I? Uh, Next, the only cooperative game I've got on the list. Well, semi-cooperative. Now, this is Shadows Over Camelot. Back in episode 17, I did a re-review of this classic uh, genre-creating game. This is a game where you play the brave knights of the round table who are striving against and trying to complete a variety of quests. There's picks and Saxons attacking from the flanks, Camelot's under siege, the Black Knight's holding a joust, Excalibur has gone missing, there's the quest for the Holy Grail, Lancelot's gone insane, and if you defeat him, there's a nasty dragon to deal with. Everything assaulting you on all sides. This was the first game to introduce a hidden traitor role to a game and is considered by many to be one of the first cooperative board games. And I still say it is one of the best and most pure examples of that genre, the hidden traitor genre. This one is fantastic at all player counts. And one of the cool things in this game is players can drop in and out in the middle of the game. Now, if you have role players, improv fans, or thespians in your group, that kicks this up to the next level because they're going to love the role-playing elements of this game. Let's let's just not forget, though, that as you pointed out, when you've played this game long enough and may, enough times, there are optimizations that a player can will learn that do make the game yeah. a little less challenging for the experienced players of the game. Yeah, this is one that after over time you may be able to solve it. Just hope everyone is on the same page so you don't avoid the, the quarterbacking. So the one player who does know how to play isn't just telling everyone else what to do. So finally, we have Heavier Fare. Meaty games that are most likely going to be the only game you get in after dinner. Yeah, and this is one where the socializing is going to probably drop because it's a lot more focus on the games. Now, I'm not saying you're not going to talk to each other and have a good time. You're still playing a social game. You're still having fun at the table together. But these do take a little more concentration. So straight up, I got to say, I'm not a NASCAR fan. I'm actually not a fan of any type of road racing. Like we have the Detroit Grand Prix and all I know is it gets really annoying because I live near the river and I can hear the cars. Uh, it's not my big thing at all. I don't even like racing role play or video games except for that um, burnout because you smash cars instead of actually race them. So this is why I was shocked by how good I think Thunder Alley is. Thunder Alley is the best racing game I have ever played. Like this easily beats out fan favorite Formula D for me. This is a NASCAR based racing game that is, uh, takes into a, a effect many of the things unique to NASCAR and distills it so well into the game. You, for one, are playing an entire racing team and not just one car. That alone makes it better than almost every other race card game I've played because it's the total points of your entire team that matters, not just who finished the race first. Now, you're going to combine that with a brilliant card-based movement system that does a great job representing NASCAR-style races and how the cars move. It's designed that, so that one card play will often move a pack of cars instead of just one. Now, deciding when to use solo movement to break out from the pack versus pursuit movement, staying in the back, and making sure you don't get left behind is really gives that NASCAR feel, the actual strategy of the game and not just zoom, zoom, big, fast cars. Now, they also have rules for wear and tear, pit stops, and crashes that just add more to the simulationist feel of the game. Now, again, I am not a fan of real life races. I am in no way a NASCAR fan, but man, this is a good game. Racing is one of those odd sports where I would rather claw out my eyes than watch a race. <laughs> But games about racing are a whole different story. Um, and, and now for me, video games too, because I can sit at Forza for hours on end. Um, and uh, for a, a note, for those that do love it, there are expansion packs available for uh, this game. And if you're really not a fan of NASCAR, but would like to give it a try, there are other options with uh, Grand Prix or mm -hmm. Apocalypse Road, which are basically the same games with other uh 
other settings. Apocalypse Road. I, I knew I knew about Grand Prix because it's the same game, but now you're doing Formula One, right? I had no idea there was Apocalypse Road. I'm going to have to look into that one myself. Yeah, Apocalypse Road is probably going to be the, the one that uh, I, um I'm trying to remember the name of that uh, game where you used to drive around killing people because um, that's uh, Carmageddon. Uh, yeah, it, it sounds it sounds very uh, sort of Carmageddon esque. Well, if you can start shooting other cards, that's definitely bringing it to the next level. Yeah. Very cool. I got to look that up. So I got to say, like, there, there, I, I'm starting to think there is a board game about everything. Like, I'm almost positive. Like, there aren't many themes that haven't been touched by some publisher or designer. Uh, for those of you on the internet, which I know most of you are, probably heard about Rule, what is it, Rule 31 or Rule 34, sorry, Rule 34. I think there's probably a board game version that there is a theme, a game for every theme. Now, some themes are pretty out there. And one of those is the next game on my list, which is Scoville. This is a board game about breeding hot peppers. Yes, in Scoville, you're a pepper farmer trying to plant and crossbreed the best peppers and fulfill market orders, as well as getting some sweet bonus points for having the best chili during the chili cook-off, where the hotter the chili, the higher the points. Now, there's some auctions, there's drafting, and a really unique movement system where you plant peppers on a field which is a grid and you move your farmer around the field and when they walk between two peppers they crossbreed them and get the hybrid prepper or hybrid pepper based on the two combinations uh there's a little grid that tells you what type of pepper you get when you combine the two uh there's way more going on in this game like i said we're into the heavier games i'm not going to be able to even cover it here but i gotta say it is a fantastic and very uniquely themed game that works great with six you know i've seen this on your shelf so many times but somehow never played it uh mm -hmm. or for that fact even thought it would be a serious game so it's good to know that it you know, yeah, this one's a, up there. The, real game. Yeah, set collection, market management, uh, trying to planning ahead, lots of strategy. It's good. It's, it's, it's a very solid game. So finally, the last game on the list. We're going to go bigger, heavier here. Uh, even the scope of this game is epic. That is Struggle of Empires from Martin Wallace. I wanted to have some kind of direct conflict style game where you're players versus players. I didn't want to go with dude folk on a map. I wanted something a little more abstract than that, but I wanted something with the 4X feel. Now, I totally would have said Twilight Imperium, but you can't fit that in after dinner. So I did settle on this Wallace Classic. This is a pretty typical Age of Renaissance colonialization style game, at least in theme, right? You are spreading out from Europe and doing nasty things to the other people of the world, slowly taking over, building uh, your big empire. You're building armies, you're building fleets, you're making alliances, you're establishing colonies, you're improving your economy, and trying to do that better than anyone else. Now, what I do dig in this game that sets it apart from other similar themed games like, say, Diplomacy, is that all negotiations and treaties in this are binding. So you never have to worry about a player stabbing you in the back. Now, they may stab you in the front by forming a treaty with a different player next turn, but it's never that, where you agreed not to do this, and then all of a sudden they do it. You're never going to have that in this game, which I think makes the game much more accessible. But you do need to be aware that this one is more than likely going to be a, you know a four hour slog it's a it's a serious hunk of game yeah it's a big one I, I say i wanted i wanted something big and epic to finish off the list i wanted to have that in there for those of you who do want some meat at the end of the game plus something where you're more a little more face to face scoville it's all about points and yeah maybe someone's farmer cuts you off and it's a little annoying that's a little different than someone's army taking over central america from you so there you have 12 of my hidden gem games to play after dinner. I hope and I've opened your eyes to something new and given you some new games for your wish list. So uh, Arzades has joined us in the chat and uh, we've had a little more uh, chat going on. Uh, and she Excellent. games mentions that uh, uh, Formula D, while not a better game, might be a little more accessible to people. Yes. No, I agree. Uh, Formula D, I, I, to me, it just wasn't a hidden gem. It right. wasn't, 
obscure. I think most people, it was on tabletop, right? Well, wait and played it in front of the world. So I think most people have heard of that game, but yeah, that would totally be on this list uh, in the, probably the medium weight because there is some meat to that game, but man, it's long. And and that was our Zades, not ancient games. I apologize. Uh, Our bad. Sorry about that. uh, And and our Zades is uh, upset that there are a couple of these games, which he has seen played, but never actually gotten a chance to sit down and, and play themselves. So, well, they're, they're still here. You just got to point them out the next Monday. Though I'm working on the pile of shame though over there. Damn it. Did it wrong. We're working on the pile of shame. So, uh, but yeah, though, most of those are definitely games I still like. So I am more than willing to play. Scoville has been a while. Scoville's one. I feel like I'm like, man, it's been a while. We got to play that one again. Plus, Hey, wait, we totally have to play it because I have Scoville labs on my pile of shame. So we need to play Scoville twice, once because it's been long enough since I played it that I want to refresh the rules, and then the labs rules, which I guess the labs adds a new little personal lab for breeding peppers because sometimes in the game it can get really difficult and you can get cut off and you're like, I really need a ghost pepper, but I can't seem to get the right combo. Well, if you have your little little personal lab, it makes it a little easier to make some of the rarer peppers. And yes, the hottest pepper in the game is the ghost pepper and it's clear and see-through with glitter in it. It's The, the game's kind of over the top. It's pretty cool. And again, it's, it's I, like, who's heard of a, a game about breeding peppers? Well, this was a great talk, but if you'd like to read more on this topic, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you will see this and other questions answered in blog form. Send us your questions over on the website under Ask the Bellhop or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com or as usual, hit us up on social media. We need those questions. We are starting to get to the bottom of the pile, so the more you send, the better. Patreon patrons at the good tip or better level do get their questions bumped to the top of the list, so if you've got a pressing question you need answered right away, that's a way to get it done. Speaking of our Patreon, a shout out and a thank you to our backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Misdirected Mark. Join Phil, Chris, Bob, and now Camden every Tuesday night at 845 Eastern, 645 Queens time, as they talk about games and game mastering. Brian Kurtz, uh, thanks for that message on Patreon. I looked into it, and I think you got the link. So now Patreon patrons get an RSS link that gives them all the bonus audio right in their podcatcher. Duran Barnett, thank you. Joe Swick, again, huge thanks for the birthday gift. Um, As you've heard, we've already played it once, and I'm looking forward to playing it again. Steve D., thanks very much. Missing you in the show. Yeah, it's been a while, Steve. I hope nothing bad has happened. Jeff Seuss, thank you. Hope to see you Saturday. William Fisher, thank you. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Mom. And welcome to our newest patron, Danielle Thomas, better known as Major Kayla in the lobby, our chat room. Well, that seems to have been a double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to help support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Live to hit your podcatchers at YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. We'd like to invite you to hang around and join us in our penthouse suite for an off-the-books after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on. (laughs) 